Welcome back to Train Signals VMware vSphere 5 training. You're watching Creating and Modifying Virtual Guest Machines. All right, so we've reached that point in the course where we're about to start deploying virtual machines. For those of you that know this process, eh, this is going to be a good refresher. I got a couple of new things for you. For those that have never done it before, this is going to be a very, very cool lesson. So we're going to discuss the three different ways that you can create virtual machines. We're going to talk about how you can download virtual machines from the Virtual Appliance Marketplace. Now, Virtual Appliance Marketplace, for those of you that aren't familiar, these are where different vendors can store virtual machines that are pre-configured, pre-packaged with their software. All you have to do is download it, and the file format for this particular virtual appliance is .ovf. You import it into your virtual center, and you deploy it immediately to vSphere. And voila, all you have to do is power on the virtual machine. It already has the software. Everything's configured. You probably just have to configure some TCP IP stack, you know, maybe the root username and password, et cetera, et cetera. And within minutes, you are up and running with that application, properly configured according to the vendor's standards and specifications. Very cool thing, very easy way. There's literally thousands of virtual appliances. Check it out. We're going to move on to the, VM the VMware Guest OS install guide. I'm going to give you some references to, to some guides that you should look at before you start uh, deploying virtual machines. We're going to talk about how you can change the virtual machine's BIOS settings. We're going to talk about creating ISO images or CD, DVD install media. We're also going to talk about, well, how do I create a library of ISO installation media? Just something that could come in handy. Using the vSphere data store browser, how can I browse the data stores on vSphere if I want to download a file, upload a file, maybe delete a file um, even? We're going to also discuss how I can access my servers using Secure Copy Protocol, SCP. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to give you some free tools and my recommendations. How you can access uh, ESXi using SSH. For those of you that didn't know, ESXi still has SSH access. You still have to enable it, and it's very, very limited. So it's not as broad as what it was with ESX. So please, nobody get any, any crazy ideas here. Uh, we're going to talk about creating a new virtual machine with a fresh OS install and then we're going to talk about the vSphere 5 EFI firmware option so that if you don't want the Phoenix BIOS you can enable the EFI option if you wanted to. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, three ways to create a virtual machine. So obviously you can create a virtual machine using the fresh install. Easy, traditional, we know that. You can create a virtual machine by downloading and deploying aka importing a virtual appliance from the marketplace and I'm going to show you how to do that or you can take a physical machine and P to V it. P to V means physical to virtual conversion. Now we summarize P to V and under P to V you can do several things. Let's say you have a Hyper-V deployment or a Zen server deployment or some kind of a, another infrastructure, another virtual infrastructure. Maybe you have VMware workstation deployed, whatever the case might be, and you want to import those virtual machines or you want to convert them to ESX, then you can use the conversion method from V to V. So it's not a P to V, it's a V to V. So you can get very granular and very you know, creative with how you can import virtual machines. But for the most part, these are the three main areas uh, that you can, or main ways by which you can import virtual machines. All right, downloading VMs from Virtual Appliance Marketplace. So I've provided the the, the web URL for the marketplace. There are thousands of virtual machines that are available again. Some are unlimited free usage, others you have to uh, pay, pay a fee. I mean, it's a service at the end of the day, it's an appliance. They're giving you the intellectual property. You're paying a fee, everybody's happy. You have a platform to run this particular appliance on it. Once downloaded, you simply deploy. Then in the vSphere client, bada bing, bada boom. So let me switch over to the GUI. Let me show you where you can go to access the virtual appliance from within Virtual Center. All right, so it's very easy. From the file menu up here, you can click on File, and then you can, um, if you've already downloaded the OVF template, you can click on Deploy. It'll prompt you to uh, browse for where you have it saved, for example. You can select it, and voila, you can just deploy it right away. So that's if you've, do if you've downloaded it manually, if you went through the browser and, and browsed through that website I told you, downloaded the appliance you want. Now, there's another option if you click on File up here and you click on Browse Virtual Appliance Marketplace, it'll open up a browser, or for lack of better words, it'll open up within a browser, inside a browser. Once um, that's open, you can just browse for the particular appliance that you want. So, for example, let's say I wanted to download this particular appliance, and I scroll down here or over here to the right, 
and I click on download now it'll take you through the process so it acknowledged what you want to download you click on next it already populated the name based on what the vendor calls it you can feel free to change it click on next how do you want to deal with the with the file you want a flat file you want a thick provision thin provision I'm just gonna leave it as flat just for default purposes you choose the network that you want to connect it to and that's it bada bing bada boom it's going to download that particular appliance as soon as I click on finish it'll start the download process and it will make it available as a virtual machine within your ESXi or within your vSphere client now, I'm not gonna download this you guys get the general idea of um, how this works VMware guest OS install guide so before you start installing a guest operating system within your virtual machines I strongly recommend that you consult some of these guides that I have on the screen for you now just as a rule of thumb vSphere 5 happens to support the most guest operating system of any other virtualization infrastructure or virtualization hypervisor on the market it's very flexible it goes across you know Linux Unix Windows of course Mac etc etc so check out these guys uh, these guides they're, they're an interesting resource before you start deploying your virtual machines changing BIOS settings and a guest VM so a virtual machine mimics a physical machine so if a physical machine has a BIOS then a virtual machine also has a BIOS the idea behind the virtual machine is we want to be able to create the same concepts of physical machines in a virtual machine so we have Phoenix BIOS for those of you that are familiar on physical servers and desktops etc etc VMware also adopted a virtual BIOS that happens to also be built on the Phoenix code that is available to a virtual machine now you can access the virtual machine when you reboot a, a VM you just have to click F2 and you have to be able to click F2 quick enough in order for you to get into the BIOS of the VM if you want to boot off of a CD DVD just press escape uh, for the boot menu in the BIOS you can also set the boot order CD then DVD or a hard drive whatever whatever or maybe pixie boot if you wanted to do that uh, note that VMware typically calls the BIOS firmware so I just want to make sure the terminology here rhymes just in case this is one of the questions you get on the VCP5 exam so that you are ready for it now there are two types of BIOSes or firmwares um, within VMware's virtual machines there's the standard BIOS which is off of the Phoenix build and then you have your EFI firmware option I'm gonna talk about that a little later on let me show you how you can get in and change some of the BIOS settings within your uh, VM alright so let's say we wanted to power on FS01 here let me go ahead and open the console that way we can power it on Now, if I power it on, if I can click F2 quick enough, I can get into the BIOS. See, I, I couldn't even do it. I couldn't even click F2 uh, quick enough to get into the BIOS. So what do you do in this case? So it's very simple. We're going to click on VM, and we're going to drag down here to where it says Edit Settings. Once you're in Edit Settings, we're going to go to Options. Under Options, we're going to find Boot Options. Several different things in here. Now, obviously, we want uh, if you wanted to change the BIOS type from the regular Phoenix BIOS to the EFI the machine would have to be powered off and then you would make the switch I'm gonna come back to that later now power on boot delay so right now it's set to zero which means it's going to flash right through the my my opportunity to hit F2 and I'm not gonna be able to see it and that's why we're, we're not able to see it if you wanted to put a delay in milliseconds then you, you know you can specify whatever value you want in here there's another useful or handy feature that I found every time I want to get into the BIOS I can just click this and the next time the virtual machine reboots it will automatically go into the BIOS so I find that um, easier for me uh, to do now you can of course set this as a standard if you wanted to do that you can also configure what do you want it to do when the virtual machine uh, fails to find a bootable device how how much do you want it to wait before it uh, retries or reboots the system I'm gonna keep this at default but you can feel free to change it by default set to 10 seconds so now that we have this I'm gonna click on OK and I'm gonna go ahead and give this thing a reset take a look at that that's pretty cool so when you get into the BIOS finally um, you'll see that 
everything is just as a traditional BIOS. You're used to this. This is a, a traditional BIOS that you've probably seen before. You can go into the advanced. What makes sense for us at this point is you get to the boot order. How do you want your boot order to go first? So for example, I want to make sure that my CD-ROM is set first, then my removable disk, then my hard disk. Once I'm done, I'm just going to click on exit. I'm going to save my changes and voila. The next time it comes up, if there's a CD-ROM attached to it, it will boot into that uh, CD-ROM drive. Let's go ahead and power this thing back off. All right, creating ISO images of CD, DVD, install media. So it, it's very easy to create an ISO image with, with most CD, DVD authoring applications. So if you have one you know, available on your desktop or on your laptop, or if there's one of, you know, particularly that you like, fair, feel free to use it. All we care about is to create that ISO because having the ISO is a quick way of deploying uh, software. So for a quick and easy ISO authoring application, we recommend you, know, you, you can use LC ISO Creator. And uh, there's the uh, the website the website also, or you can use another uh, free ISO recorder for XP Vista seven versions, and, and I've given you the, uh, the the web address as well. So, creating ISOs is again an easy and quick way of deploying these images. Now, let let's see how we can do that and create maybe a library out of them. So, again, it's important to to have an ISO library of commonly used OS and application CD DVD because some of the benefits you don't have to worry about the media you don't have to worry if it's scratched if it's uh, broken you, you you misplaced it whatever the case might be physical access to servers uh, slow network whatever the case might be if you have it in digital format then it's easier to store you can store it on your SAN if you wanted to do so that all your ESXi hosts can access it you can even store it on an NFS or a SIFS even on an SMB SIFS share on a Windows box see what I like to do is you can create a SIFS share mount that SIFS share through ESX so that you can you have a central location for your Windows boxes and also for your virtual machines and anything else that needs to access this that way you have one central software repository instead of two one for virtual machines and maybe one for physical machines uh, etc so one SIFS share makes it just easier so again creating a library makes life in general easier so using the vSphere uh, data store browser vSphere client allows you to browse the different data stores, whether they're VMFS, your NFS, etc., etc. You can access the data store browser via your web browser directly to the ESXi server. You can access it via the vSphere client. Let me show you how you can access it via the vSphere client. So let's go ahead and choose ESX1 here, and let's we are on the summary window. One of the quickest and easiest way that I usually access the, the data store is I will right click, I'll find it under the summary of the particular ESXi host, I will right click it, voila, browse the data store and now you have access to the different directories and you can manipulate them however way you want. You can upload files, you can download files, uh, you can copy, you can delete, you can refresh, create new folders, whatever the case might be, you can manipulate what's on this NFS or on this VMFS data store. From an NFS perspective, you can do the same thing. Uh, right click, browse the data store, and, and voila, you have the same thing. Now, if you go back to the home page here, you'll see that you have access to uh, data stores and data store clusters. So if I click on the data store and data store clusters, you'll see that you have your data stores that are immediately listed. This is cool because you can select uh, the first data store. Obviously, you have a summary for it. You can refresh it, you can enter. If you are using uh, storage, uh, the DRS, you can put it in maintenance mode. You can browse the data store, that'll bring up the same window I brought up earlier. And you can assign user-defined uh, storage capabilities uh, so that you're profiling the different storages, storage capabilities that you have within the environment. Now, the cool thing is that you can click on virtual machines and it will list all the different virtual machines that you have um, on this particular data store. So I don't have a lot on my iSCSI, but if I click on my NFS and I go to virtual machines, you'll see that I have a bunch of them here. Now, you can also go to the host and you'll see which host, uh, for example, is participating in NFS, which host is participating... Um, in iSCSI, I have both of them in iSCSI. If there's any particular warnings, you'll see them. So a quick snapshot if they're connected, uh, some of the resource utilizations, etc. If you go here to uh, performance, it gives you some nice charts on what's going on. 
actually the NFS ones have uh, more going on here so it gets a little more colorful see <laughs> so again gives you the ability of, of taking a look at what's going on you want to pay attention to latency here um, make sure latency is always low configuration again uh, gives you access to what's going on with the data store you can click on properties here you can enable um, the storage IO and then set uh, set the proper value be careful on how to set this particular value this could have a ne negative performance effect um, on your uh, virtual machine so unless you really know what you're doing I would not recommend changing this so I'm gonna keep this uh, disabled for now click on tasks and views it's the same alarms all of this stuff uh, for the most part is the same permissions you have storage views which will give you sort of an idea of what's connected to what so just a quick summary quick snapshot of what's going on in the uh, environment click on iSCSI here if you go under configuration again um, you, know, you can also enable the storage IO here for VMFS be careful it's going to give you a warning that you know modifying this value could have a negative effect so be careful click on cancel I've cho you know the manage path will show you how many paths there is to this particular storage and the the multi-pathing path selection or protocol that's being used right now is fixed so just um, you know couple of different ways of accessing the storage here or even browsing it through through your data store using secure copy protocol SCP with vSphere so sometimes you might want to be able to SCP directly into the ESXi box maybe you, you, you want to copy the files from your local drive like your desktop up to ESXi and you wanted some kind of an application just to interface with ESXi so that you're not doing a lot of command lines and if you're like me I just want GUIs right so there's a couple different ways that uh, that you can access this first of all ESXi doesn't support FTP so you can't FTP files to it you can use SCP to copy the files to and from an ESXi server there are you know obviously there's a lot of SCP uh, freeware out there but I like Veeam's fast SCP it's a free download you get go to veeam.com we're gonna give them we're gonna give them a free advertisement here you go to veeam.com you download fast SCP and you're able to access either virtual center or ESXi it's actually pretty cool I want to show it to you so if we minimize virtual center here and we go in and I've downloaded and I've installed it already so if I double click on it and under servers here I'm gonna right click and we're gonna click on add so I'm going to go ahead and add both of them. We're going to add uh, the virtual center server and we're going to add an ESXi host. I want to show you the difference. If I do virtual center, uh, the cool thing about it is it will automatically enumerate all of my ESXi hosts. WiredBrainCoffee.com. Click on next. It's going to prompt you uh, for the username and password. And finish. Voila. Now, if you expand this a little bit, you'll see that under my um, Hilton Head, South Carolina, under my cluster here, I have both of my um, ESXi hosts. Now, if you didn't want to access it that way, maybe you want to access it via the ESXi host itself, you can add the server, except this time you can add just the particular ESXi host that you are interested in. So this time we're going to select ESX or ESXi. All right, so basically what it's saying, hey, you've already added this uh, through Virtual Center, so I can't add you. So let's go and do this. Let's go ahead and remove it from Virtual Center just for completion's sake. I want to I wanna show you guys how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the server. Yes. And let's go ahead and add ESXi now. I command you to work there you go all right so if you give it the root username and password and click on finish now it uh, it enumerates that now you can expand it very easily and you can go in you'll see it immediately uh, detected the different data stores that you have in there and you can expand them and voila now you can drag and drop files to this particular data store um, if you want to just from your desktop or from from anywhere else for that matter now one thing I also like about uh, downloading the VeeamFest SCPs if you click on tools here they've given you access to putty 
So you don't even have to download Putty. You can just uh, from Fast SCP, you can click on it and it'll automatically launch. So again, pretty pretty cool here. So you don't have to have you know, multiple tools, even though I've downloaded. But uh, it's pretty cool to to know that you have that. So that's how you can access uh, access Fast SCP and copy files back and forth between ESXi hosts. All right, accessing ESXi using SSH. So we just finished talking about PuTTY now. By default, ESXi will not allow you to get SSH access into the host. SSH with ESXi is meant to, to be used not as a management and administrative tool, but rather as a troubleshooting VMware support style tool. So you only enable it when VMware or when you're doing certain troubleshooting tasks uh, for the most part, out of the box, in general, it should be disabled. Otherwise, you'll always get that warning within ESXi saying, hey, SSH has, has been enabled. Uh, for security best practices, it is recommended that it stays disabled. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you where you can enable technical support mode so that you can access the particular server using SSH. All right, to do that, we need to access the console of the server. So I'm going to open up my management um, interface directly into my blades and I'm going to authenticate once I have my blades I'm going to access the one that I want here and let's go ahead and click on management Click on F2 to be able to access it. Root is good. Okay, once I have that, I'm going to scroll down to where it says uh, troubleshooting options. And then uh, once in there, I'm going to go ahead and enable um, SSH. Now, once SSH is enabled, I'm going to minimize this. Let's minimize this as well. I can use something like PuTTY and log into my server. Yes, I'm going to accept the certificate here and I'm going to go ahead and log in with root and I'm going to go ahead and log in with password. And voila, you've logged in. Now you can also enable the ESXi shell if you wanted to, and it's from the same screen here. So while you were on the console of the box, you can also uh, enable the ESXi shell if you choose to do so. Again, depending on the amount of troubleshooting that you're, that you're doing and what you're trying to do from an SSH perspective will dictate what you need to enable and disable. Now here's what happens if you go back to uh, the traditional or by default having SSH disabled. Obviously, if I uh, try to access it via PuTTY now, just to give you something to relate to here. As you can see, it is not responding on that particular port. That particular port is automatically blocked because you have it disabled through the console. So just wanted to show you how that works and where you can enable it and disable it uh, just in case you come across that. All right, creating a new virtual machine with a fresh operating system, fresh OS install. So that's going to be relatively easy. What we're going to do is we're going to create a new VM, but I want you to keep certain things in mind. Keep in mind the consequences of doing so. So um, cost of software licenses. So what happens is because virtual machines are so easy to create, we end up just creating so many of them, and that leads to two problems. First of all, it leads to VM sprawl because we have all these VMs in the environment. We have to patch all of these VMs in the environment, but we don't remember that there are software licenses associated with, with our actions. So we are held accountable for how many virtual machines we deploy. There's a management overhead. They need patching. They need antivirus. They need uh, someone to take care of them, someone to maintain them. We need documentation. What are we building? What's on there? You need training of junior administrators and support staff. You need backups must be performed on these new virtual machines that you're creating. Third-party software licenses based on the number of servers. So keep all of this stuff in mind when you're deploying a virtual machine. It's not just, hey, this is kind of cool. I can do it. So let's go ahead and create 20 of them. There are consequences to, to the actions that we're doing. So just keep those in mind as you're going down that path. 
All right, so to create a virtual machine, you need to know the name of the VM. Obviously, you recommend, we recommend that you create some kind of a standard. Um, I would recommend using some kind of like a, a VM in the actual name or a V, just so that if you go through Active Directory and you want to search for all of your VMs, there's an easy way. There's a some kind of an identifier that you can query for. So if there's a VM or there's a V in, in the name, you can always query for that particular value. You're going to need a server and a data store to place the virtual machine in. You're going to need an operating system, 32 or 64 bit, the number of processor or virtual processor, how much RAM you want to give it, the disk size and the disk type. You also need to have an ISO available in order, and you can have these ISOs on local VMFS data stores on the server or on the SAN. You can have physical media on the server itself. So you can have the physical media in the ESXi CD-ROM drive and you can connect that CD-ROM drive all the way up to the virtual machine so that you can install it. Obviously keep in mind it's kind of annoying because every time you want to put an ISO or some kind of a, an install you gotta walk all the way to the data center put it into uh, the ESX host. So it, it, you know, physical media is kind of outdated. That's 20 years ago, but you know, it's still an option. Client device. So if you're connecting from your desktop or connecting from your laptop, you can use the CD-ROM that's attached to your laptop or desktop to serve up the ISO image all the way to your um, virtual machine as well. All right, so let's go ahead and create a new virtual machine and try to install a fresh OS. All right, so what I want to do here first is I have the virtual machine's guest operating system. I have it on my C drive, right? So I have, what do I have here? I have Windows Server 2008 R2, and I have the key for it. I have the keys file so that I want to upload the, both of those to my data store in order to install it. Now, if I didn't want to upload it to my data store, and I want to use them or I want to connect them to this particular ISO on my machine, Let's go ahead through and let's go through this process. Uh, let's go to hosts and clusters here. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways and let's let's do this on ESX2. Uh, creating a virtual machine is relatively easy. You can right click your DRS cluster if you wanted to uh, create a new virtual machine. You can do it at the data center. You know, you can do it at almost any level. I'm going to do it at the cluster level. It helps me choose. It, it enumerates all of my hosts. So if I do this here and click uh, create new virtual machine. We're going to go through the custom just so we get all of the options. I'm going to call this FS, uh, let's call it 02. I don't want to put it in any particular folder, otherwise I could place it in the operations folder if I wanted to, but it's my file server, so I don't want it in there. I'm going to click on next. I want to deploy it to ESX2. Uh, this is the only data store that is available to me. Now, if I choose ESX1, I obviously have more data store uh, choices. But I want to deploy it to ESX2. I am going to deploy it to iSCSI. What virtual machine version, the hardware, virtual hardware you want to use? You want to use uh, virtual machine version 7, which is the older version uh, of hardware, or 8. I'm going to go with 8. And then what types of operating systems do you want, uh, you have access to, you have access to Microsoft Windows here, to Linux, and you have access to others. So under Microsoft Windows, you have access to a slew of virtual machines. Under Linux, um, it's the same thing as well. Look at that. The support for Linux is just amazing. And under other, you can also select, um, you know, you can also select Apple, uh, Fresh BSD. So again, the amount of guest operating systems that are supported is amazing. Now keep in mind, if you want to deploy to Apple, uh, Mac OS X, you need to be able to do it on, it's only supported on Apple hardware, so you can't deploy it on an x86 uh, of your choice at this point. So the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to choose Microsoft Windows here, and it already has the uh, Server 2008 R264, which happens to be the operating system I want to install. So I'm going to click on Next. How many virtual CPUs, how many cores for the CPUs uh, do you want to install? Now keep in mind, this is kind of new. In the older versions of ESX, vSphere 4 and 4.1 and earlier, we could only choose the vCPU, no cores. This is kind of comes from, uh, for those of you that are using VMware Workstation, we have this feature there. So I'm going to do um, two cores. I'm going to keep it one, one vCPU. I'm just, just playing with it for now. Uh, from a memory perspective, I'm going to give it 4 gig. Now, this is kind of interesting because you can change the metrics by which you want to measure how much memory you want to give it. So if you go to megabyte here, it'll just change it to 4,096. I don't know if you can find it useful, but just thought I'd uh, mention that. How many virtual NICs do you want? Uh, so if you select more than one, it'll allow you to place... Um, 
place them in different virtual networks for the purposes of our demonstration. I'm just going to go with one. And um, uh, let's put it on, I don't know, virtual machine network here. Uh, you can change the virtual NIC type. I always recommend that you use VMX NIC 3. Uh, it's the most efficient virtual network adapter uh, that you can use. So I kind of like to use that for, uh, for all of my virtual machines. What type of uh, virtual SCSI controller do you want to use? For the most part, the LSI Logic SAS is the, uh, the most ideal for all, of the, all the types of workloads that you have. Now, if you're deploying SQL, Exchange, SharePoint, Oracle, some of these applications that require intense I.O., that require a lot of IOPS, that require heavy I.O., then I would most certainly switch it to VMware Pair Virtual. The rule of thumb is you select VMware Pair Virtual for any application that you think is going to generate 2,000 IOPS or more. So if 2,000 IOPS and more, VMware Pair Virtual is your baby. It's your choice. Anything less than that, I would go with LSI Logic. It's been tweaked and configured for all types of workloads. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of the middle ground when, when the application is mixed profile, so to speak. So I'm going to keep it at that. Click on Next. Do you want to create a new virtual disk? Use an existing virtual disk. You don't want to create a disk at this point. You can attach an RDM. It's grayed out right now because I don't have anything that's, uh, that's configured for it. But I can attach a LUN directly into the virtual machine. This treats the virtual machine exactly the same way as you treat a physical machine. Sometimes if it's a file server, as we're creating right now, uh, and it's a terabyte or two terabytes LUN, you don't want to create that terabyte as a VMDK, right? You can just serve it up as a raw device mapping directly through the hypervisor to the virtual machine, and the virtual machine can then format it as an NTFS uh, format. So there's no VMFS going through. There's no translation. There's a little bit of an overhead because it's still going through the hypervisor. It's still going through the VM kernel, but it's passed through. So it's very, very uh, little overhead for that matter so you're getting direct access to the hardware so that's from an RDM perspective I'm gonna go ahead and click on next I'm gonna give it 40 gig um, you can do flat disk you can do thick you can do thin provisioning thin provisioning here means it's thin provisioning at the VMware level so keep that in mind you can store the virtual machine disk with the virtual machine or you can select a different place to store it I'm gonna keep it at default uh, for the most part, you're not changing this. The only time you would change the virtual device nodes here is if you were doing uh, clustering. If you're doing clustering between different virtual machines, then you would want to create uh, a shared cluster here or a shared virtual um, SCSI. So that's the only time you would change this. Otherwise, for the most part, these should all remain uh, defaults. You, you shouldn't want to change them. And that's it. This is a summary of what it's going to do. If you click on finish, it's going to go ahead and do that for you. You can edit the virtual machine uh, settings um, before, before completion. I'm comfortable with what I have right now, so I'm going to go ahead and click on finish. All right, so we've created the shell. We've created the virtual machine here. I want to do two things. First of all, I want to go back into edit settings. I want to make sure that I go back into the BIOS so that I can select CD-ROM the next time it boots. So I want to go ahead and enable it. And I'm going to click on um, OK here. Now, a couple of different ways of attaching an ISO to this particular virtual machine. So if I right-click and click on Open con Console here, I can power on this virtual machine. Once this virtual machine is powered on, what you can do is you can click on this little button here that says uh, connect or disconnect uh, the CD-ROM, and then you can browse on your local disk. You can connect the, uh, to the D drive if it's the CD-ROM drive on your local desktop, or you can come down here and select an actual ISO image on a data store, or you can connect to a host device. You can browse for an ISO image on the local device. So a lot of options. So a data store is obviously self-explanatory. It's a data store on ESXi. This is if you're connecting to the host's device, or you can connect to an ISO image on the local disk. So if I click on it, and I go into computer here on the C drive, we have that particular file that we can connect to, and I can install um, Windows Server 2008 right away. I can do it that way. Now that's one option. The other option, and before we do that, I just wanted to, um, to make sure my CD-ROM is first device. We're going to click on Exit, and yes, we're going to save the changes. What I want to do here is go into the VM, and let's go down to Edit Settings. 
Under the CD-ROM, you have several different options as well. You're setting it to the client device. Okay, if there's a client device that you're connecting from, it has a CD-ROM, you can connect to it. Host device means it's the host that's connected to ESXi. I don't have anything connected to ESXi right now, the actual host itself, so I can't use that. You can also connect to a data store ISO file. So if you had your ISOs located somewhere, you can also connect to them and connect them that way. Now, they're not here. How do I get them on here? Anyone? Bueller? All right, so there's a couple of different ways. You can use Fast SCP as I showed you, or you can upload them directly using the data store browser. So if I click on ESX2 and we're under the summaries tab and I want to upload them into the iSCSI data store here, I can right click it, browse data store. And let's say I wanted to create a directory. I'm just going to right click anywhere, create new folder, and let's call this ISOs. So now I have a new directory called ISOs. If I double click on it and go into this directory, I want to be able to upload a file to it. So you see you have two options. You can download files or upload files. If I click on upload file, you can upload a fo an entire folder or file by file. I can browse my local disk at this point. And I want to upload this particular ISO, so I'm going to click on open and yes. And it's going to take its sweet time, obviously, but it's going to upload this particular ISO to my environment here and I can also upload the keys file uh, for the product key if I wanted to. All right, there you go. Now if I wanted to upload the keys, again, you can also accept text files on here. So let's go ahead and find it. Click on open, yes, and voila. So I've uploaded the necessary files that I need. So now I'm going to close out of the data store browser here and let's go back into the settings of this particular virtual machine. Under CD-ROM, I'm going to select the data store. Browse. It's in iSCSI. It's under ISOs. And there it is. I'm going to click on OK. Now, keep in mind, you want to make sure you connect it. Connect it at power on and make sure it's connected. Otherwise, it won't power on. The virtual machine won't see it. So this is the equivalent of having your parallel cables or you know your SATA cables or whatever the case might be, it might be in a physical desktop connected to the physical CD-ROM drive. So this is where you can enable and disable that. Now keep in mind also, when you're done installing your guest operating system, it's important that you come back in here and set this to client device. This could interfere in the vMotion process. Now, I also want to recommend that if you're not using the CD-ROM, if you don't have a use case for it, after you've installed it, remove it. If you keep this enabled, this will generate I.O. As long as this is connected to the SAN, there's I.O. being passed back and forth that could, in some instances, have a negative effect on the performance of the VM. So if it's a Citrix ZenApp server, if it's a SQL server, if it's an Exchange server, I would remove all the unnecessary virtual hardware from the profile here. So I would remove the CD-ROM, I would remove the floppy drive, add them when you need them, after you're installed, you don't really need this for anything. So I'm going to click on OK here. Once it's done, let's go ahead and see what happens if I open the console and power it on again. Actually, the console is already open. So let's go ahead and reset this thing. Look at that. It has started Windows 2008 installation. So at this point, it's just a regular Windows installation. I'm not going to go through the, the, the entire inst process. I'm sure you guys have seen this 100 times from here on forward. It's just a regular Windows install. It's no different uh, than anything else that, um, that you guys are used to. There you go. I mean, I'm just going to get this installation started. I'm going to go ahead and select Enterprise here. Let's get this started and push forward with our presentation. All 
All right, vSphere 5 EFI firmware option. So with vSphere 5, you can choose from the traditional BIOS firmware or the new EFI firmware. The new EFI firmware doesn't work with Windows, so keep that in mind. It um, doesn't work with any kind of network boot. So those are two important things that you want to you want to make sure you you're aware of. Now, EFI firmware does allow you to use Mac OS X on ESXi host running again on Apple platform. It offers built-in uh, drivers for hardware and also a shell. Uh, and keep in mind that the, uh, what's new in vSphere 5 is ESXi servers can also be booted on systems uh, that are using the uh, EFI firmware. So it's not just the virtual machines that can be booted. ESXi, the host, the physical host themselves, can also be booted um, using the EFI BIOS. Now let me show you where you can enable. I showed you earlier, but I want to make sure I reinforce that again. Let's go ahead and minimize this. And if I select FS01, which is powered off right now, let's go into the settings. And let's go under boot here, or under options, and then boot. You can switch it. So right now it's set the BIOS. You can set it to EFI. Once you set it to EFI, you can force it into the EFI uh, setup screen. By selecting that, you can again um, do the same thing as far as the delay is concerned. Click on OK. As soon as you power this thing on, uh, this time it will go into uh, the actual EFI BIOS this time. Let's go ahead and power it on and let's open the console. And there you go. Uh, from here on, you can you can go through the shell and just modify whatever you need to modify if you're using um, EFI. All right. So, what did we cover in this majestic lesson? <laughs> so we started off by talking about the three different ways by which you can create virtual machines. We said that you can create it just using a fresh install. You can use the virtual appliance from the marketplace, or you can download the OVF files and import them into uh, vSphere. That way you can do a P to V of physical machines. You can also do a V to V of other virtual machines that are running on different platforms. We talked about the, the virtual machines that you can download from the virtual appliance marketplace. I showed you how to do that from within the GUI and you have access to thousands of virtual appliances so use them. I uh, gave you the guest OS install guide locations and make sure you download these PDFs. Go through them before you start installing the guest operating system just in case there's any kind of particular tweaks that you should be aware of. Changing the BIOS settings in a, in a virtual machine guest, we talked about EFI, we talked about the traditional Phoenix BIOS, we talked about how you can create ISO images uh, using your preferred CD or DVD uh, software and gave, you know, we gave you also um, what we recommend and some of the freeware stuff. Creating a library of ISO installation media, some of its advantages, uh, why use it, you know, so you, you don't have to worry about losing the physical media. You don't have to worry about walking up to a physical server, putting the media in. We discussed all the benefits. We talked about how you can browse the data stores within vSphere. We talked about the fact that you can browse them in a couple different ways. You can browse them off of the summary page of the ESXi host, or you can go to the home and access them via the data store browser. Showed you some of the performance tweaks and all that good stuff. We also talked about how you can access ESXi using secure copy protocol and I showed you how you can go to Veeam and download Fast SCP, which gives you access directly into ESXi. You can copy fo uh, files up to ESXi and download files from ESXi. We also discussed how you can access ESXi from a, a secure shell, SSH, and the fact that it's disabled by default. And the point to having SSH with ESXi is for troubleshooting purposes only if you're talking to VMware support or if you're doing support yourself. We also went through and created a virtual machine. We also started the installation of a Windows Server 2008 guest operating system. We talked about the differences between the EFI BIOS or firmware and the traditional Phoenix style uh, firmware and when to use EFI, EFI, especially if you're using or if you intend on virtualizing Mac OS X on the Apple platform. Finally, I hope this lesson was very informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.